Okay, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is uh, our topic of uh, study and uh, discussion today. Uh, this is written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who is one of the two authors um, credited with writing the uh, lyrical ballads from which we heard uh, one side last time. Electronics in the classroom, gotta love it. Um, sorry for the beeps and noises then, I can't even see how to turn it off. Um, so Coleridge wrote alongside Coleridge, uh, Wordsworth the Lyrical Ballads and he came at it from a rather different vantage point than Wordsworth. So we've looked at a few Wordsworth poems now. I think we looked at We Are Seven, uh, we looked at Tintern Abbey and we looked at his uh, Immortality Ode, and in all of them, those three, although they're not all lyrical ballads, he tends to look at nature, uh, the physical world as we see it in, a, in multiple senses. I talked about that uh, last time as being a, a but as a total presence of, uh, shot through with a sort of a supernatural sense. Um, so there's a natural supernaturalism. Whereas Coleridge, who wrote the poems alongside Adam, he, he came at it from a different, from the, from the opposite side, more or less. So he presented supernatural figures in his poem, like this one, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. So more of a horror fiction type thing. And yet the horrible figures were presented in nature in some ways as natural objects. So there's a, there's a, uh, famously uh, an albatross in it, right? And the albatross gets placed around the mariner's neck. Um, if you're a fan of C.S. Lewis's uh, fiction in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there's an albatross in it and the albatross actually speaks. And the speaking of the albatross is actually Aslan, speaking from, uh, from this albatross that lands on the mast. I think we got some, not albatrosses, but those stupid Canadian geese outside which I won't lay around anyone's neck. I might, they, they're quite tasty actually, but we won't, we'll, won't get into that. <laughs> um, sorry, that's on record here as well, that's unfortunate. But the um, albatross in Lewis's work speaks on behalf of Aslan, which is sort of a Christ uh, figure, at least he is in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So that's very interesting, and, and Lewis is probably reflecting on the use of the albatross here in the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And, and it, whereas in Coleridge's rendition, the albatross is just an albatross. And yet, it seems to have supernatural significance. So when the albatross ends up, first of all, it's thrown around his neck. The ancient mariner, it's a symbol of guilt. They're blaming him. And then eventually it falls from his neck when he is able to, it's a sort of a central passage, when he prays and repents effectively of his earlier misdeeds, at that point then the, sh the story shifts. So the sin is taken from his neck as it were, falls into the sea, disappears, so it it's a, has almost a theological sense to it. So but that, you would never find that in Wordsworth. That, but that sort of supernatural, the machinery of it, of, of this story, and the uh, more explicitly supernatural themes are there in The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And it's, uh, it's a famous poem in its own right. Uh, very, very different in spirit than Wordsworth's poems. But effectively, the two of them coming at the same issue from different sides, one from the supernatural, the other from the natural, and then they meet in the middle. Uh, and so as such, that's an interesting uh, poetic uh, experiment that the two are undertaking. Now, uh, Coleridge himself writes about it in a, a critical work that he writes called the Biographia Literaria, which we're not going to get to on this course. I'll do it if, I, if you're in a course on romanticism with me or in lit theory eventually, the Biographia Literaria of, of 1817 rather. And in chapter 14 of that work, he comments that the, Amer the ancient mariner was founded on a strange dream. Um, 
uh, or actually, this is what this is what Wordsworth sa said about it. But it is actually Word Coleridge does write about it in chapter 14. But this is Wordsworth's comment. He said it was founded on a, a strange dream which a friend of Coleridge had, who fancied he saw a skeleton ship with figures on it. And then we both decided that this would make a good topic for a poem. At any rate, um, the poem as we are going to read it here, and I'll have it here. I'll I have it here on the screen so that you can see it as well, was published at different times and with different features. So the original poem is simply this poem here, as you can see, the main poem. Afterwards, he added what is called the gloss, and the gloss is here in um, the left-hand margin. Right, it's an ancient mariner meeteth three gallants, bidden to a wedding feast, and detaineth one. Uh, we will find that gloss added to the preface throughout it. And what it does, the effect of the gloss, is it makes you read the poem differently. Sometimes it's stating the obvious. Sometimes it's adding uh, commentary, which is helpful. Sometimes it's not very helpful. Sometimes it's al almost absurd. It goes into digressions about seemingly inconsequential details. But sometimes it's saying things that we would never have known. And, and altogether, it makes us think about the relationship to some degree between criticism and poetry. And poet Coleridge is both a critic and a poet. And he's probably known as well for his uh, criticism as his poetry uh, by the later English-speaking uh, literary tradition. So Coleridge is a famous critic. And this Biographia Literaria is seen as the one of the greatest works of literary criticism of the 19th century. Uh, so I just wanted to add that, and that's why you see that in the left-hand column there, the gloss there. But the poem, I'm going to read it, um, is, is an exploration of the very same sorts of themes that Wordsworth had undertaken. So the natural supernaturalism, although I guess we can flip it here and say supernatural naturalism. Right, but same sort of thing. And what were the features of that with, with uh, Wordsworth? Well, they were more, uh, as I said, panentheistic. When Coleridge wrote this, uh, he was probably not a Christian. He was probably a Unitarian. Unitarians were rationalists. Uh, they believe there's only one God. They rejected the doctrine of the Trinity, which is Orthodox Christian theology. And uh, so what you can see here in this is Coleridge seeking for supernatural explanations in the natural rather than seeing them as distinct realms. But he, he's on the process of thinking about this, and it will take him uh, years to move towards an Orthodox Christian position. But I don't think it's here in the poem. It might be, to an extent, in the gloss. The gloss is added later when he's thinking about it, uh, the issues here. But I think it can be read on multiple levels. Yes? In regards to the gloss in uh, his time, is that a normal thing? No, to do? not at all, no. It's something that if you think about it, um, you almost never find it in literature, and never by the author himself. You might find it in, a, uh, in the margin put there by I don't know, uh, an editor of a volume. You find it in, in Bibles often, right? They're very common study Bibles or something like that. There's a commentary usually at the bottom, but it could be along the sides. And the purpose of the commentary is to help you understand what you're reading in the poem. My question with the gloss is, is Coleridge really trying to help us understand what is going on in the story? Or is he trying to suggest that Whenever people do that, they are reductionistic. They get something of it, and they make it clear, but they're also missing the point. So just, and the same with a biblical, sort of the help in the margin or in the, in the, at the base of, the, ta of the, the text, it's more authoritative than the original text. I think Coleridge was concerned about that as well, how critics were effectively uh, being seen to be more important than the original authors. I think that's there with him. And the way he does that is by presenting 
the sort of things that one would read by critics. I, I should also note, this is the age when the higher criticism of the Bible is, is, on, is taking on legs. So in the German-speaking world, very much so, and it is about to be so in the English-speaking world as well. And along with that, um, theological liberalism, questioning the, uh, the idea that the Bible is the Word of God. They would say, rather, it's, it's, it's a human document pr produced by human authors who are seeking to present God's truth in their own way, but they are limited by the conditions of their time and their age and you know, human uh, wisdom and so forth. And then they're often looking for sources behind this. I mean, you'll have this in your uh, New Testament classes, I assume, or something of the sort. Eventually, you'll engage with those sorts of issues. You know, is, is there a, a source behind all of this and source criticism? Um, and then there'll be questions about whether the historical events being depicted actually happened or not, or whether these were written by later authors uh, and uh, written with the, uh, with the aim of suggesting something miraculous had happened that will justify the community that wrote it, claiming to be God's keep people and so forth. So it's a way of reading scripture that undermines the plain witness of scripture. And Coleridge is, is, in, is uh, aware of that, he's engaging with it, and to some degree he's critical of the whole enterprise. But now he's not applying it to scripture, he's applying it to his own words, but he's right in that if it's true and relevant in scripture, then where is the authority of the author himself even? Like Coleridge wrote this, but what do his words mean? And who's going to tell us exactly what the words mean? What's the authoritative understanding of Coleridge's own words? Does Coleridge have them? Do they come from the text? Or do they come from the interpreting community that reads the text? These are all issues that become more and more um, prominent as the 19th and 20th centuries uh, progress. But let me get to the poem because I've spent a lot of time with a the preamble there. The argument <laughs> here is uh, that, and he does present it in the form of an argument, although it's not here in this, uh, is that um, uh, presented, and it's in my text, no, it's not there. Um, it's called an argument, and the argument is, is uh, I think drawing our attention to something like a Miltonic argument. If you remember at the be beginning of the books of Paradise Lost, there was the argument that summarized what was going to happen, and then he, the poem presented it, and then the argument would continue in, at the beginning of each book. I think that's more or less what here. So here's the argument. How a ship, having passed the line, that is the equator, was driven by storms to the cold country towards the South Pole, and how from thence she made her course to the tropical latitude of the great Pacific Ocean, and of the strange things that befell, and that it, in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country. So that's the argument. It's the description of the whole poem. Well, that's like Milton's Paradise Lost. So it's just a summary of all the action. But the summary of all the action does very little to uh, justify the richness of the text. So let me read the text. Then, it is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long gray beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stops thou me? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, gray beard loon. Eftsoons his hand dropped he. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright eyed mariner. The ship was cheered. The harbor cleared, merrily did we drop, below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright, and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon, 
the wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as a rose is she, nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy. The wedding guest, he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his o'ertaking wings and chased us south along. With sloping mass and dipping prow, as who pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud rear roared the blast, and southward aye they f we fled. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold. Pardon me. Wondrous cold. Where is it? Oh, no, 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 no. That's what I got for looking away there. Wondrous cold. And ice, mast high, came floating by, as green as emerald. And through the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen. Nor shapes of men, nor beasts we can. The ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there. The ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swoon. At length did cross an albatross. Through the fog it came, as if it had been a Christian soul. We hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit. The helmsman steered us through. And a good south wind sprung up behind. The albatross did follow. And every day, for food or play, came to the mariner's hollow. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine, while all, whilst all the night, through fog smoke white, glimmered the white moonshine. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why lookst thou so? With my crossbow I shot the albatross. So I'm going to stop there. That's the end of part one. Now, you can see the uh, features of the poem which are very different than Wordsworth's poems. Uh, the regular meter, the regular rhyme scheme. You could, you could hear, I, I overemphasized it when I read the poem, but I did it on, on purpose uh, to show that there is more of a rhyme to it. It's called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And the effect of rhyme in, uh, in any language, but particularly English, the one that I know best, is to uh, give a sense of um, an enchantment. Uh, it's a story, but it's a story in which you're sort of spellbound by the story. I mean, children's nursery rhymes are written in rhyme, and they're written in rhyme for a reason. There's something pleasing about rhyme and order. Children like it, and many people think that po all poetry is rhyme. And if it's not written in rhyme, it's not really good poetry. And you'll notice that in popular music of our day, that many of the verses in lyrical, uh, the lyrics of the songs are written in rhyme. Sometimes it's you know, quite syncopated like in rap music and so forth, like really heavily syncopated, like the strong regular beat and also the rhyme that'll go with it. Uh, but this is what you expect in a certain type of uh, poetry. And it's the type of poetry in which something magical is going to be told, right? So nursery rhyme, that sort of thing. So the, the way in which the story is told conveys something of the substance even. And those are expectations in the reader. So with all of that said, what does the gloss do to this? I will just read the gloss now, having read part one, let's just read the gloss. An ancient mariner meeteth three gallants bidden to a wedding, wedding feast and detaineth one. The wedding guest is spellbound by the eye of the old seafaring man and constrained to hear his tale. The mariner tells how the ship sailed southward with a good wind and fair weather till it reached the line. The wedding guest heareth the bridal music, but the mariner continueth his tale. The ship drawn by a storm toward the south pole. 
the land of ice and of fearful sounds where no living thing was to be seen, till a great seabird called the albatross came through the snow fog and was received with great joy and hospitality. And lo, the albatross proveth a bird of good omen and followeth the ship as it returned northward through fog and floating ice. The ancient mariner inhospitably killeth the pious bird of good omen. Now, all of those are descriptive, but is the description telling you everything that's transpired in the story? What does the, what does the gloss do, the narrative explanation, do to the original text? Just your impression, because it retells the tale to some degree, and it does so very briefly. Which do you like better? And why? If you just want the facts of the story, you can look them up on the internet. You know, you can get a Cole's Notes or whatever it is, the internet, you know, rather than let me read the story, I'll just get the summary on the internet and not have to read it. But what, what is, the, yes? Yeah, I know what you're getting at. I think that's correct. I mean, certainly Coleridge, th Coleridge puts it in there for a purpose, obviously. And the purpose is to some degree, whether it's the intent or not, to juxtapose the two and to make you think about what is the nature of a story? What is it that we value in a story that will want us to tell it in a poetic form rather than simply in a narrative of factual accounts. Because in the 18th century, you know, go back to Mr. Swift, we looked at the modest proposal, he's living in a world that increasingly rationalistic, uh, assigning uh, mechanical and material causes to everything, saying everything can be empirically explained, understood by science and human reason, um, and that description in the gloss to some degree is in agreement with that viewpoint. But the story and the way it's told is at odds with that. And to some degree, it often will miss the point. And it will miss the point uh, as we continue on even more so, sometimes quite shockingly so. Uh, but here it concludes with the ancient mariner inhospitably killeth the pious bird of good omen. Now that's an interesting comment. Because now we have a moral judgment in the gloss. It's not there in the account, right? The account is just the, the uh, shipmates of the ancient mariner looking at him in horror. There's something like, what's wrong with you? Because you're looking, there's something about you that is uh, disturbed here. God save the ancient mariner from the fiends that plague this. So suggesting a supernatural and, a, and an, a malign influence on his actions. What are you doing before he does it? And then he shoots it. Now he says the fiends that plague thee, this on the other hand, the narrative gloss just says that it's an act of inhospit, it's in, he's inhospitably killed it. You're not a very good host. Is that the extent of the problem here? He's just been a bad host. Like, would you have said that that's the problem with the shooting the bird at this point, that he's been a bad host? I, it's like the accounts uh, in, uh, um, I've heard of the uh, destruction of, of, of the city of Sodom, that it had nothing to do with uh, any sort of immoral transgression. It was all about inhosp inhospitality. That's why they were being condemned. It wasn't because of any moral uh, judgment on uh, on the sexual acts or the depravity of the people of uh, that city. It was because of inhospitality. There is inhospitality. There's no doubt about that. Is that the limit of the problem? Coleridge is suggesting, I think, that this is, while true, inadequate. That's the point. 
and doesn't really get to the nature of it. And the text suggests something more. He is uh, possessed by fiends, they suggest even. Now let me go back on that. So, he, so the, uh, the uh, shipmates, God save thee, and they invoke God, and they also say that there are fiends that plague thee. So the, the shipmates are appealing to supernatural agency. The gloss, on the other hand, just speaks about human actions and nothing beyond it. There are other elements here that are interesting and which the, the gloss you would have thought would speak to but doesn't speak to. What are those elements? Well, the first one is the, the, the very troubling one. At first, the ancient mariner grabs um, the, uh, the man, one of the three young gentlemen who is going to the wedding feast. He grabs hold of him with his hand and he says, you know, get your hand off me. And then he does take his hand off, but then he fixes him with his eye and he can't move. Like what's going on there? It's almost as if he has a supernatural power over him just by gazing upon him. You would have thought that the gloss would comment on that. And it does. But what is the comment? The wedding guest is spellbound by the eye of the old seafaring man and constrained to hear his tale. Spellbound? What does that mean? I mean, we use that phrase in English, to be spellbound. It could be literal in the sense that it, there has been a, 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 an incantation, a spell that's been cast, and he is held by it. But there's no sense of that in the text. So here he overdoes it and suggests a supernatural power, whereas later it's the opposite. How is it that he, and it says, the mariner hath his will, as if his power, the, his willpower were able to overpower this man so that he must hear what is being told. Now, in the background of this is the story of, uh, uh, the, the biblical story of the wedding guests. And there are many variations on that by Jesus, though, but the story of the wedding guests who are invited to the wedding and they don't want to come, if you recall. They don't want to come to the feast. So Jesus goes out and tells them to go in the highways and the byways and get other people to come in. And then one, uh, they come in and then one of them comes in and he doesn't have the, the, um, his uh, wedding clothes on, right? So the three who are called to come here, um, or rather are bidden to a wedding feast, they want to get to the wedding feast. So he's playing with that story at any rate. It's in the background of the reader's mind. Uh, and he would assume that, that his readership had read the biblical story or it, had heard it at any rate. So here we have three young men who are going to a wedding feast and they are kept from that. At least one of them is. Now the wedding feast, furthermore, in biblical understanding has connotations of uh, God and his people. Right? It's the messianic feast that's spoken of not only in uh, the Gospels, but in the book of Revelation, the bride and the bridegroom, right? So these are, uh, and, and communion to some degree is a, a participation in that and, and an anticipation of that. So that's also there in the background. So this isn't just an old wedding feast. You're thinking about God calling his people to celebrate the wedding feast with him. And now these three are on their way to one. This man stops him from going there. This is not a good thing. He's being detained from it and he wants to go, but he can't. This figure of the ancient mariner is preventing him from going to the wedding feast. And so when he hears the loud bassoon, trumpeting as it were, or bassooning, I guess, whatever the <laughs> verb is for the bassoon, uh, he starts beating his breast because he can't get there. And therefore, he's going to be outside the, the wedding feast, wailing and gnashing his teeth in the outer darkness, right? So it's a, a curse. He has to get there, and yet he can't get there. So there's a sense in his mind that the ancient mariner is some sort of demonic figure, keeping him from celebrating the wedding feast. At least I think that's there in the text. The gloss makes no mention of it. As if, it, as if uh, the reader were ignorant of it, but the reader isn't ignorant of it, but the gloss is. 
and 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 it's clear that the mariner or rather the wedding guest is has that in his mind which is why he's so distressed and yet um, he can't choose but hear and he's held by the words of the ancient mariner himself so there's the power of the story that that holds him and forces him to sit and so when he sits and he speaks on he goes so the bride paced into the hall red as a rose as she nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy and he speaks on and what is the story well the story then is of the ancient mariner himself and what he did well what's the story well he goes down on a ship and he drops below the kirk where is it there it is below the kirk below the hill below the lighthouse top the kirk is the scottish word for church so he drops, he does, goes down into the underworld, in other words. He goes below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. Now he's going down south, right? It's a voyage south, but the suggestions have the connotations of going down into the underworld. And I would submit to you that that is what's going on here. Coleridge is talking about going on a voyage to the South Pole around the Cape uh, that Captain Cook himself had gone. So Coleridge had been probably hearing about these uh, voyages of Captain Cook. He went to the South Pacific and so forth and saw all sorts of extraordinary uh, beasts and so forth, like this albatross, which nobody in Britain has seen, but they've read stories about this giant bird now. And as they go down there, they go into a landscape that uh, if you read any Dante, which we have, at least I did last semester in my class, is a hellish landscape. If you recall in the Inferno, it's filled with ice. And as you progress down further and further down into the depths of the Inferno, it gets colder and colder. And the figures which began at the top of the Inferno blowing around in the air are eventually encased partly in ice and eventually wholly in ice and eventually under the ice. And, and the space is is more and more compacted, more and more constrained. So it's, it's a frozen landscape. Ever since Dante, the idea of the ice is associated with hell. And so down, when the mariner therefore goes down to the South Pole with the, with the icy landscape, it is sort of hellish. And you, it is even not only icy and hellish, you can hear it cracking and growling and roaring and howling like a lion. Remember the devil is compared to a lion, roaring, looking for somebody to devour? All of those are, are uh, things that, uh, associations that Coleridge has picked up from scripture uh, and that have entered into the, do into the uh, narrative here. And then there's the albatross. And the albatross is of course just the figure and you can imagine the ship, the shipmen having gone down into this realm which is uh, inhospitable to human life and all life for that matter and they're being dragged there by a wind they're being blown almost against their will it's pushing them along there's no life there's only ice and then finally there's an albatross and they're happy because they finally see some sign of life and they see it as a a, a, a good omen because uh, as if it were a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit. Okay, so the ice is finally broken up. He's a bird of good omen. What do they do? Then he shoots it. Okay, so it, it concludes with that. But as I say, the narrative of the poem is much richer and more evocative than the gloss itself to establish that. Okay, but he shoots the albatross. Now this albatross is a figure that, of course, is a bird of good omen, but it seems a lot more than that, right? It's gone down to the underworld where they are. It's a form of life. They hailed it as a Christian soul. And he shoots it. And he shoots it seemingly without reason, certainly without justification. Part two, the sun now rose upon the right. Out of the sea came he, still hid in mist and on the left went down into the sea. 
And the good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work him woe, for all averred I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, said they, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow, nor dim nor red like God's own head the glorious sun uprist. Then all averred I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. Twas right, said they, such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down. Twas sad as sad could be, and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper day, the bloody sun at noon. Right up above the mast did stand no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath, nor breath, nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. By the way, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, that's how it begins, with the painted ship on the painted ocean, right? And that's the one in which the albatross is. So Lewis is reading into this uh, text by Coleridge. And then these famous words, water, water, everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water, everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O oh Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about, in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burnt green and blue and white. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow, and every tongue through utter drought, was withered at the root. We could not speak, no more than if we had been choked with soot. Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. Uh, part two here uh, presents, and if you've ever seen uh, Master and Commander. Have you seen that with Russell Crowe? Terrific movie. No, watch it sometime. And it it it's a, another take in film version on the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Right at the beginning, they're being followed, and to some degree, what's that name? Uh, the or name of that movie with Johnny Depp, the uh, uh, the pirate one. Pirates. Okay, is it okay? With 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 the the ghost ship that's coming after them. Yeah, yeah, Dead Man's Chest, but it's still the same series, right? It's later in there. But it's again the same thing. We're going to find the ghost ship coming after them, and it's coming after them even though there's no wind, and it's coming faster and faster after them without the wind. And there are spectral figures on the decks chasing them, etc. It's again engaging with this. Um, the same landscape that uh, Coleridge establishes here. But part two tells us of a, a, a few things. One is the ancient, a, ancient mariner's sense of guilt at what he's done. And note that it moves then from a four-line stanza to a six-line six stanza. He breaks the line scheme. So uh, up till this point, it was regularly four lines here, the sun right there and there. And now he moves to a six-line stanza there and he does likewise in the one that falls and then he moves back to the four line stanza. So he breaks the rhythm and the lineation of the uh, account and that, that breach of form you always need to attend to. So in, in when you're reading poetry or reading prose for that matter and you see a, a pattern has been established and it, particularly if it's a poem because in poetry patterns are more regularly uh, established and intentionally so when you deviate from that it draws your attention to it, and then it asks you, why has this happened? 
and what's the meaning of it. But the first thing you have to note is that it has happened. So, and here we note that it has. And what is what happens here? Well, then, then, then the narrator, who is the ancient mariner, now reflects for the first time. He's not just telling a story. He's disturbed by what he did. And so it expands, and it does so for two direct stanza. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work him woe. For all of bird, I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Our wretch, said they, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow. So now there's dialogue between himself and the crew for the first time, and they're blaming him. When he says, and I had done a hellish thing, that's what they are saying to him. You're a damned villain. How dare you? And then the very next one, the very next six lines, the uh, crew that accused him of doing a hellish thing will give him the, will have the exact opposite verdict. Nor dim nor red, like God's own head, the glorious sun uprist. Why is his own head the crown of thorns on his head? Right. So they're, they're, again, they're the metaphysical or the Christian imagery are shot through the whole of the, of the account. But, but when they see the red sky in the morning, all avert I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. So it wasn't the fog, it wasn't the bird that brought the good wind, it was the other bird. So they flip it around. Twas right, said they, such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist. So in the gloss, his shipmates cry out against the ancient mariner for killing the bird of good luck. But when the fog cleared off, they justify the same and thus make themselves accomplices in the crime. Now, isn't that interesting? Where does that come? They make themselves accomplices in the crime. Whose voice is that? Right? So now, as I say, the gloss does many, many things in the poem. Uh, but one of them is it seems to go well beyond the account of the poem itself. Because it made themselves accomplices in the crime. Well, who, who said it was a crime? Certainly the uh, ancient mariner is not saying that it is. The, uh, his shipmates don't think it is. They started by saying this is a bad thing. Now they say it's a good thing. But the narrative gloss said that this was not only a terrible thing, it was a crime. And by supporting him in it, they are complicit in the crime against nature, or at any rate, against the albatross. So now we start to wonder, who is this, who is this voice in the gloss? And what should we make of this voice? At any rate. The fair breeze blew and the white foam flew and, flew and on they go. So they blow, go along for a bit and then the breeze drops and they sit there because it's a sailboat and they can't move. And it is hot and it is dead. The air is dead and it is hot. And if you know anything about uh, seawater, you can't drink it. If you drink it, you die. The reason you drink is to hydrate yourself, but if you drink salt water, it has the opposite effect. So if you're really thirsty, you look, oh, there's water down there. Yeah, sure, but you can drink that water and it will expedite your death. So don't drink it. Now, they, nowadays, they have desalinization, tablets even, and stuff like that, or ways of, of creating fresh water. But in those days, you bring barrels of fresh water. When you run out of them, that's all you've got. You have to go to land to get on board more fresh water. And you cannot drink that water. So again, water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, not any drop to drink. So again, like the icy landscape, it's a hellish landscape. It's a place where they, and water has the connotations of the presence of God. Right, There's, this is a God forsaken place. There is no life. And the very deep did rot. And then the narrator says, or the poet says, Oh Christ, that ever this should be. And there are all sorts of spirits that now he, now he comes to the conclusion that a spirit plagued us so. Line 133. Nine fathom deep, he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. Okay, so the idea that 
the gloss suggested that they were accomplices in the crime that he committed. So this is just a moral crime by an individual. The poem suggests there are far worse things that are happening here. Now they're being pursued by supernatural forces. Some of the spirit that plagued us so. Now who is this spirit? Let me go through the gloss. I'll read the whole gloss in, uh, from uh, part two. His shipmates cry out against the ancient mariner for killing the bird of good luck. But when the fog cleared off, they justify the same and thus make themselves accomplices in the crime. The fair breeze continues. The ship enters the Pacific Ocean and sails northward even till it reaches the line. The ship hath been suddenly becalmed and the albatross begins to be avenged. Water, water everywhere, etc. And now a spirit had followed them. One of the invisible inhabitants of this planet, neither departed souls nor angels, concerning whom the learned Jew Josephus and the Platonic Constant Constantinopolitan, I always get that, I can't say it, Michael Salas might be consulted. They are very numerous and there are, is no climate or element without one or more. What? The shipmates in their sore distress would fain throw the whole guilt on the ancient mariner in sign whereof they hang the dead seabird around his neck. Okay, but this, the spirit, can it's what sort of spirit? It's the sort of spirit that other authorities will testify to. Josephus, Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century, uh, who's one of the uh, chief sources for the story that is told in the Gospels, but now by an unsympathetic Jewish historian, but he also speaks of Jesus Christ and basically the, uh, many of the, uh, the fact that there is such a figure, it's not just a myth that was made up, he, he, he uh, records this as well. But the shipmates would throw him, feign, throw him in, uh, place all the guilt on him, and so they stick the bird around his neck. So they are now doing what? It's instead of across the albatross, so what are they doing? What word would we use for this, for the ancient mariner? What, are they, uh, what do we call this in English when you lay the blame on somebody else? Scapegoat. Remember, escape. I don't know if you recall in uh, the book of Leviticus on uh, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. There are two animals. There's one that sacrificed in the temple, right? And the other is a lamb and or, or a goat, and they lay the priest lays his hands on the goat, and the sins of the people are placed on the goat, and then the goat is driven out into the wilderness, where it is given over to the devil, basically. But one will atone for the people and the other is given to the devil. He's being given over to the devil here, the ancient mariner. As if the whole guilt was on the ancient mariner. That's the commentary of the gloss. Whereas he has already said that they are accomplices in his crime. And as it turns out, and this is where it becomes even more interesting and complex, the narrator is correct. Because they are going to be, we'll see in the next part, and in part four, the uh, shipmates are all going to die. All of them. And why is that? And why not the ancient mariner? Here's my suggestion, just from reading the text, but I'm not sure I'm right. I had done a hellish thing and it would work him woe. Does he feel guilty for this or are they just accusing him of being guilty? Line 91, I'd done a hellish thing and it would work him woe. Is he confessing that he had done it or is he giving reported speech? There are no quotation marks. It sounds like he feels like they're correct. They, they say this, but he is not giving it. Uh, in English, we, we put the quotation reported speech around it if it's somebody else saying it, but we, it's not what we're saying. But here, there is no such thing. 
Because look here. Here it is reported speech, right? They put quotation marks around it, right there. Right? He report, this is what they said. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why looks thou so? End quote. With my sh crossbow I shot the albatross. But it's reported speech. Whereas here, the accusation that he was responsible for this, there is no signs of reported speech. It suggests that it's his own conscience. He feels guilty then, in other words. So when they lay the albatross upon him and attribute guilt to him, he agrees with them that he's guilty. And he bears the cross. But he's bearing the cross now not only for his own guilt, although he feels that, but also for them. And they, without any sense of uh, being guilty, are going to be judged precisely because they're sinners without any recognition of their sin. That's why they die. And why the mariner will eventually be pardoned. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I don't think so. I think that's is more or less what's going on in the narrative. Part three. There passed a weary time. Each throat was parched and glazed each eye. A weary time, a weary time, how glazed each weary eye. When looking westward, I beheld a something in the sky. At first it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a mist. It moved and moved and took at last a certain shape, I wist. A speck, a mist, a shape, I wist, and still it neared and neared. As if it dodged a water sprite, it plunged and tacked and veered. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could nor laugh nor wail. Through utter drought, all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood and cried, a sail, a sail. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, agape they heard me call, Gramercy, they for joy did grin, and all at once their breath drew in, as they worth drinking all. See, see, I cried, she tacks no more, hither to work us wheel. Without a breeze, without a tide, she steadies with upright keel. The western wave was all aflame. The day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad bright sun. When that strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun, and straight the sun was flecked with bars Heaven's mother send us grace, as if through a dungeon great he peered with broad and burning face. Alas, thought I, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears. Are those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers? Are those her ribs through which the sun did peer as through a gate? And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death? And are there two? Is death that woman's mate? Her lips were red. Her looks were free. Her locks were yellow as gold. Her skin was as white as leprosy. The nightmare de life in death was she, who thicks man's blood with cold. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were casting dice. The game is done, I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistles thrice. The sun's rim dips, the stars rush out, at one stride comes the dark. With far heard whisper o'er the sea, off shot the spectre bark. We listened and looked sideways up, fear at my heart as at a cup, my lifeblood seemed to sip. The stars were dim and thick the night, the steersman's face by his lamp gleam white. From the sails the dew did drip, till clomb above the eastern bar, the, the horned moon with one bright star within the nether tip. One after one by the star-dogged moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye. Forty times fifty living men, and I heard nor groan nor sigh, nor sigh nor groan rather, with heavy thump a lifeless lump they drop down one by one.
the souls did from their bodies fly. They fled to bliss or woe, and every soul it passed me by like the whiz of my crossbow. What's going on here? So we have two figures on, on the deck of this specter ship now. I mean, if you've said that, uh, that Pirates of the Caribbean, the whatever, the rendition of it, this is a ghost ship. And its crew are twofold. And the two, there's a woman and then there's a mate. And the women and the mate probably remind us of two figures that we meet, meet in Milton's Paradise Lost, namely sin and death. Right? Sin, the woman, and death, her mate. And death being this horrid uh, shape, if shape it had none. Right? So this, these, and they're, what are they doing? They're playing dice. Playing dice for the souls of those on the ship. And who wins? Life and death wins. Not death, but life and death. They get, they get to, to uh, be cursed eternally with eternal life and yet a cursed life. And they fly by him and they look at him, the 20 of the bodies that, or the uh, five times 40 living men that fall down, they all fall dead and at, they look at him first, cursing him to the last, not um, admitting their own complicity in the death of the albatross because they agreed with it, and, but they didn't uh, accuse themselves. So they're like, again, if you, look, if you think of uh, the conclusion of Book Nine of Paradise Lost, Adam and Eve accusing one another, but of, of self-accusation, uh, there was none. They took no responsibility. Likewise here. So they all die because they have not any sense of their own guilt and their own, uh, uh, the fact that they deserve judgment. That's not there. And so their lives are taken from them, and there's one person left now. It's the ancient mariner. Let's go to the gloss and see what the gloss does here. The ancient mariner beholdeth a sign in that the element afar off. At its nearer approach it seemeth him to be a ship. And at a dear ransom he freeth his speech from the bonds of thirst. What's the dear ransom? He bites his arm and sucks the blood so that he can speak. You need to have, your mouth needs to be wet enough to speak, otherwise it's parched like the other. So he does it at the cost of his own blood. Has obvious sense of Christ's blood as well. There's a sense that the blood, and it's also mixed with all sorts of pagan horrors as well. In the underworld, the dead drink blood before they can speak. In, in the Odyssey and so forth, the dead are there, there's blood in the ditch, and when they are allowed to drink of the blood and they're all trying to get to the blood, at that point, they can now speak. Coleridge probably has both of these senses in mind. How there's, a, there's some sense of life being in the blood. So he then speaks at a dear cost. He freeth his speech from the bond of thirst. There's a flash of joy. And they partake of it, the shipmates, they, as they were all drinking all. So they're benefiting from his sacrifice once again. And horror follows. For can it be a ship that comes onward without wind or tide? It seemeth him but the skeleton of a ship. And its ribs are seen as bars on the face of the setting sun. So like a prison grate. Right? The specter woman and her death mate and no other on board the skeleton ship. Like vessel, like crew. They're both specters. Death and life and death have diced for the ship's crew and she, the latter, winneth the ancient mariner. So she wins him. That's what they're after. They wanted him. She wins. He has life and death. Life and death has had him. Is that a good outcome for him or a bad outcome? The rest of them are gone. Right? They all die. But he's left, and he's left, there's a life in death, and he's under a curse. There's a life in death. And what's the curse? The curse is to have to tell his tale. No twilight within the courts of the sun, at the rising of the moon, one after another, his shipmates drop down dead, but life and death begins her work on the ancient mariner. So she won his soul, and now she's going to work her will on him. Part four. 
But at this point, the wedding guest loses his mind <laughs> because now he hears from the ancient mariner that this man in front of him has, is uh, controlled by life and death. That's why he's here. And now he's speaking to him and he is controlling him through his eyes. So he's terrified. He's kept from the wedding feast and he's controlled by a, like as if he were possessed by a man who is himself possessed. So what does the, what is the uh, wedding guest say? I fear the ancient mariner, I fear thy skinny hand, and thou art long and lank and brown as is the rib sea sand. I fear thee and thy glittering eye and thy skinny hand so brown. Fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest, this body dropped not down. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. And never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie. And a thousand, thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea, and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. I closed my lids and kept them closed, and the balls like pulses beat, for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, nor rot nor wreck did they. The look with which they looked on me had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. The moving moon went up the sky, and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up, and a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main, like April hoarfrost spread. But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt alway, a still and awful red. Beyond the shadow of the ship I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship I watched their rich attire. Blue, glossy green, and velvet black, they coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Oh, happy things, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The self-same moment I could pray, and from my neck, so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. Okay, so this is a key turning point, as I said, for, for obvious reasons, um, but some may not be so obvious, so I will say a little bit more about this. But in part three, the 200 men have fallen dead. They fell dead because they were prey to death, whereas life and death won one of them, the ancient mariner. And she's apprehended one of the three men that was on his way to the wedding feast as well. But he did not die. So he assures him, I did not die, but what happened? He, pre he sought to pray, but he can't pray. He can't pray every time he seeks to pray or ere a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. So from within him, there is no capacity for forgiveness. He wants to be released from what he did, but he can't even bring himself to pray. He even closed his eyes. I closed my lids and kept them closed and like balls, like pulses beat. They lay like the dead at his feet and he wished to die but could not die. And then the, the turning point 
is when he sees the water snakes. Now, earlier on, there was a reference to these creatures. Now, this is back in uh, part one. Uh, he saw these horrid creatures that he was disgusted by. Is that in one? No, it's in uh, part two. Part two, line uh, 124. The very deep did rot, O Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. He's disgusted by the natural world that he sees around him. Now he sees the same natural world, these snakes, water snakes moving there, and he sees them, and this time he's transformed, he's delighted, and something comes to him from outside of him and allows him to bless the very water snakes that earlier he had cursed. So a transformation of sorts happier. And he says, O oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed him unaware. So now he's talking about a supernatural agency that has brought him to do the very thing which he could not do, which is namely to pray. And at that point, when he is able to do that, then the albatross falls from his neck. So it's talking about a supernatural agency that will uh, forgive him for the sin that he was bearing, which was not his, but also that of his crewmates, at least according to the gloss. So all of these things are suggesting, in a very horrific story, the account of a supernatural agency, which is very evident within the course of the poem. Wordsworth doesn't do that in the same way, right? It's his own internal sense, but there aren't external agents acting upon him. It's rather from within him he senses the supernatural. Here, supernatural is outside of Coleridge and, and acting upon him. Coleridge's account of this is more, I would say, more um, traditional. You know, when we're not the source of supernatural agency. Supernatural agency are, are figures outside of us. Um, at any rate, I will read the gloss of this. The wedding, the wedding guest feareth that a spirit is talking to him, but the ancient mariner assureth him of bodily, his bodily life and proceedeth to relate his horrible penance. He despiseth the creatures of the calm and envieth that they should live, and so many lie dead. But the curse liveth for him in the eye of the dead men, and in his loneliness and fixedness he yearneth towards the journeying moon and the stars that still sojourn, yet still move onward. And everywhere the blue sky belongs to them. And there is their appointed rest in their native country. This is one of the more ridiculous comments again. And is their appointed rest in their native country and their natural homes, which they enter unannounced as lords that are certainly expected. And yet there is a silent joy at their arrival. I mean, it's sort of comic. Like it's adding all sorts of information that cannot possibly be derived from the poetic account. It's information that the editor or the, the, the writer of the gloss is adding to it, which is allegedly helpful to us. I mean, if you've read um, commentaries on scripture sometimes or commentaries on anything, they get stuck or lost in the weeds, I would say. Like they're digging down into minutia and they're getting off target and it's no longer helpful to the person actually reading the poem. They're not assisting the reader to appreciate the poem. They're getting lost in their own little academic world of uh, scholarship. But by the light of the moon, he beholdeth God's creatures of the great calm, their beauty and their happiness. He blesseth them in his heart. The spell begins to break at that point. But you can see already the uh, what I've suggested, I'm not going to be able to read the whole poem, I'm going to skip over five and six and come to seven, which is the last bit, um, that there are clear Christian symbols used in this story. It's not a Christian story per se. That's not what it's about. It's not trying to recount uh, in an orthodox fashion uh, the truths of the Christian faith. It's using Christian language and Christian symbols to suggest supernatural agency. It's using all sorts of them, and I've suggested many of them already. The, uh, even the idea of the ice and the, and the lack of water and what these symbolize, etc. But it is certainly informed by Christian thinking. Now, there are voices in part six. I'm going to skip over that, and I'll come to part seven. 
because th this part seven uh, is the final bit here. And where's part seven is line five, okay. There it is. <coughs> this hermit, which he'd heard the voice of the hermit good at the end of the last sign. Oh, actually I need that bit. He saw a her he, so here's a pilot and the pilot's boy. And then he saw a third. I heard his voice, it is the hermit good. He singeth loud his godly hymns and he makes that he makes in the wood. He'll shrieve my soul. He'll wash away the albatross's blood. Now, what does this shrieve mean, by the way? By the way, the, he's using the language of Catholicism here throughout the poem. He'll appeal to Mary, and he'll speak of the saints, and he'll speak of shrieving. Now, this is also not just Catholic, but it's Anglican, but this is almost uh, more Catholic than, than Anglican in its uh, expression. But you could, ar you could argue that it's both. But the idea of shrieving, does this term mean anything to you? It's, it's almost obsolete in the English language now. No one's ever heard of it, I bet. Uh, how about Shrove? What help if it's Shrove Tuesday? Also probably not. Okay. Um, how about the most absurd secular equivalent? Pancake day. Your pancake day. Like the day before Ash Wednesday. Yeah. Which is happens to be this Wednesday, as it turns out. Pancake day, Shrove Tuesday. What happens on Ash Wednesday? Well, in the li liturgy of an Anglican or a Catholic, um, it's the day before um, the, the Feast of Lent, uh, or Ash Wednesday is the beginning of the Lenten Feast, 40 days leads up to Easter, right? And on the day before that, you eat up everything that's in your cupboard because you're now going to be fasting for 40 days, like the 40 days in the wilderness. You're going you're to repent of your own sins. That's the period of, of repentance and so forth. Uh, it's, you know, called, I say, it's only when I said pancake day they came up with it, right? I mean, which is ridiculous. It's called pancake day. Everyone, you know, oh, I like pancakes. So it's a feast day. Actually, it's not supposed to be. It's your last day of eating normally, and you're going to clean out your cupboards, and now there's going to be 40 days of basically fasting, at least during the day, and so forth, leading up to uh, the uh, Easter. And Shrove is to, uh, to uh, forgive sins. To shrieve is to forgive sins. To be shriven is to have your sins forgiven. So Shrove Tuesday is the day that you're, go that you're going to ask for your sins to be forgiven and then you're going to enact them in the 40 days that follow. So that's what he's asking here. Shreve me. Sh he'll shreve my soul. He'll wash away the albatross's blood. Note that he's still under the curse of the woman. But this man will do it. This hermit... Go Good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea. How loudly his sweet voice he rears. He loves to talk with mariners that come from a far country. He'll kneel, he kneels at morn and noon and eve. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump. Now the hermit like the hermit in Tintern Abbey here. He's a natural figure, a pious priest of nature as it were. Uh, I'm going to have to skip over because um, I'll run out of time here, but he goes on and he says, he'll shrieve me again. Oh, shrieve me, shrieve me, holy man. Line 575, the hermit crossed his brow. Another reference to the cross. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, what manner of man art thou? Forthwith, this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony, which forced me to begin my tale. And then it left me free. So when the, the hermit bids him to speak, finally he's freed and he's able to speak. And then he does. And since then, says the ancient mariner, at an uncertain hour, that agony returns. Until my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. Echoes of the Emmaus Road. When the, the 
two disciples leaving Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus meet the risen Christ and they meet him and they, he breaks bread with them and eats and at the point at which he breaks the bread, they recognize who he is and he vanishes from their sight. And then they say, did not, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the Emmaus Road? So that's in mind here when we, with this language here. Till my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. I, to him my tale I teach. What loud uproar bursts from the door? The wedding guests are here, but in the garden bower, the bride and bridemaids singing are. And hark, the little vesper bell, evening prayers which biddeth me to prayer. O wedding guest, this soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely twas that God himself scarce seemed there to be. O sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company to walk together to the kirk and all together pray while each to his great father bends old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay farewell farewell but this i tell to thee thou wedding guest he prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast he prayeth best who loveth best all things both great and small for the dear lord who loveth us he made and loveth all now, when he hears this, the mariner leaves and he leaves and the wedding guest, it says, is stunned at this story. And he rises a sadder and wiser man the next morning. Strange conclusion. If there's a moral to the story, the moral of the story is the best form of prayer is, is loving one's fellow creatures. And then All Creatures Great and Small becomes a famous uh, uh, TV series on England. It's a, it's a famous hymn as well. All Creatures Bright and Beautiful. Uh, what, how is it? What is it? All Things Bright and Beautiful. All Creatures Great and Small. All Things Wild and Wonderful. The Lord God made them all. You know that? Anyway. It's sung in English churches. Um, echoing, echoed here in uh, Coleridge's conclusion, but it's a very naturalistic thing. So prayer isn't really the thing. It's, it's on the, again, on the vertical level, not on the, or rather the horizontal level and not in terms of appealing to God. So it's a very naturalistic conclusion to the poem. Are we to be satisfied with it? I'm not so sure that we are. He's been talking about supernatural agency throughout and now we have the Herman at the end who's giving a counter supernatural counsel. Who is the Hermit? Is it Wordsworth? I don't know. But that's the end of the story, and I think it's quite the story. Anyway, I'll leave it off at that. Um, 